mucho inglés entonces. Uh, hello, I'm Nicolas Reinhardt. Welcome to my talk called uh, Spinning Up Faro with Sim Destructions. Uh, just for a bit of background, I'm Argentinian. I work here at a company called Tempines. I don't know if you know it. It's not really known, it's underground. Uh, but this year I took a couple of months off and I crossed the ocean to go work in France at INRIA with uh, the team that developed the Faro Bertel machine. And the content of this talk is going to be based on the work I did on these couple months. So, uh, what are SIM destructions? How many of you have an idea or a notion of what they are? Okay, several of you. And how many have used them? Okay, uh, a bit less, but more than I expected. Uh, what's your opinion on SIM destructions? Okay, not very useful, and if I may add, they're also kind of a, a pain to use because they are very, very low level. I'm going to get to what they do for the ones that do not know what they do in a minute. Uh, so let's start with an example. Let's say that I, we have two arrays, and we want to add them together element by element, and we want to store the result into another array. Um, for simplicity, let's assume that we know the size. They are all the same size, no worries. So if we want to do that with a straightforward approach, it, it could be something like this. We iterate the arrays, and for every position, we get one element from one array, we get one element from the other array, we add them together, and then we store the result into the result array. That's kind of like the, the easiest way that you can think about it. It does have a problem, though. That is that it doesn't take the most advantage of our current hardware. And the reason for that is that Processors nowadays can work with multiple data elements at the same time. That is, instead of operating on one single element, for example, from each array, we could be, for example, loading four elements from one array, four elements from another array, adding them together with a single instruction, and then storing the result into the result array. And the cool thing about that is, well, you do things potentially four times faster because you're doing more work in the same time that before you used to do for a single element. Now, just for a bit of naming that's going to be used throughout the talk, the, we call the, this group of elements a uh, vector. That's why it's also, besides SIMD instructions, you can listen to vector instructions, which is, they're like uh, small differences, but in many cases they are used interchangeably. And, well, um, the reason mainly for using them is performance. Now, uh, under the hood, what happens is that processors have different types of registers. We have, nowadays, most of the registers are 64-bit wide. But in the case of vectors, you can have like 128 or 256 or 512-bit uh, uh, long registers. And in that size, you can actually put many uh, data elements. So for example, if you're working with a 128 uh, register, and you have 32-bit integers, then, well, you can put four of them and then work with them in parallel using these vector instructions. And the same, well, then the number of elements depends on, well, the size of each type. So if you're working with floating points of double precision, then you can put two in this vector. If you're working with shorts that are 16-bit uh, wide, then you can put eight. So the level of parallelism kind of depends on uh, the types you're working with. Uh, well. Why do we care about this? And the main reason, the pragmatic reason, as I mentioned, is, well, performance. I already said that. There is like an asterisk because these vector instructions are a bit more um, uh, specific than the general register. Look, you can't do anything that you would do with a regular uh, CPU instruction with these vector instructions in particular. And this changes a bit depending on the architecture and the version of each architecture. But the kind of the common denominator is that you can load things from memory, you can store things into memory, you can compare these vectors, you can do arithmetic, you can do type conversions, you can do bitwise operations, and that's kind of it. Then uh, anything else is kind of like uh, architecture dependent. If you're working on a virtual machine, you kind of don't want to get into that because it's not really portable, or well, you know that it's only going to work for certain architectures. And well, that's like the pragmatic reason, right? 
also, since we were like designing a, a feature for a VM, we were also kind of uh, wanting to explore the CMD design space because this is a really low level feature. Um, for us, the interesting thing is, okay, how can we uh, integrate it into Faro, which is a very different, uh, we're living in a very different world, right? And okay, what are the different strategies that we can have and which are the set of trade-offs that we're going to run into? And so, what we, this, okay, we have this kind of like operations that we can do. How can we use them to speed up Faro? And so we were starting to think of which operations will be amenable to this type of optimization. And this operation need to be something that performs the same task on multiple elements. And another restriction is that those elements need to be contiguous in memory. So probably operations that have to do with arrays are a good fit for that because well, arrays are contiguous in memory. And well, in the case of Faro, for example, Besides the array classes, for example, order collections also use arrays as a underlying storage, so that also can be used there. The same thing with strings. And some operations that could be amenable to that, for example, are checking if a collection includes another, an element or if um, two collections have the same elements in the same order because it's just like working in chunks and then comparing them. It doesn't matter if you're doing it one element at a time or if you're taking more of them. Uh, well, you can also, for example, remove duplicates or check if a string includes a substring. And those were kind of like interesting operations to experiment with, but I mean, they're also kind of specific, right? And there was one actually that was super general and which is the one that we explored first, which is object creation. And this one is kind of interesting because it's not immediately uh, obvious why they can be useful. And the reason is our nails, actually. Uh, I'll elaborate. So when you create an object, besides creating like the meta base, base metadata for the object, like the header, you also need to make sure that all the references, like all the instance variables that the object has, uh, are valid. And if you do nothing, by default, then you have garbage in your memory. And if you follow that reference, then you can get to all sorts of crazy places. And so when the Faro virtual machine is allocating objects, one of the first thing it does is, okay, for each instance variable, we're going to go and we're explicitly going to say to nil to make sure that uh, references are safe. And well, the way it does it uh, before the work we did was just like, okay, we have many instance variables. We're going to start like kneeling them one by one. And okay, this sounds like the kind of thing that vector instructions can help with. So what we did is we started using uh, these vector registers to do these things in a vectorized way. And for that, we use 128 bits uh, long registers, which means that we could put two uh, reference to pointers at the same time. And we said, okay, let's see, let's measure how much faster it gets. Um, we did that, and actually, we got to speed up of almost 2x. Now, this depends a lot on the type of object you have. So for regular objects, where you have like a few instance variables, the difference was not very notorious because, well, there's not much work to do. But you have to keep in mind that, for example, arrays use the same structure. So if you have very long arrays, then, yeah, I mean, you're doing, like, this kneeling once for every element. If you have, like, a, a, a array with mil, uh, tens, thousands of elements, then you're doing it thousands of times. And actually, we started to notice that when you got to arrays of, like, 200 elements, most of the time of creating an object was spent, actually, nil in memory because the other part is just creating the object header. And so when you got to that point where like the kneeling is most of the work, then if you were using like this to generate to store two nils at the same time, you get to a speed up of like roughly two times faster, which is super cool. Now, how did we do this? Okay. So we took advantage of something which is that in Faro object creation is implemented as a primitive. A primitive is a method that is implemented directly at the level of the VM. And one thing that we do with primitives is that, in general, they are run in the interpreter, which is they are interpreted. But when they are run enough times, we, the, kick co the sheet compiler kicks in, and we start generating machine code for the, the um, object creation method directly. Um, that's kind of cool because then we have like a very easy way to hook in and enter our CMD instructions. What we do is we just uh, replace the old mechanism with we'll store one um, 
nil at the time with something that can do that uh, in parallel for two. Um, that's pretty cool, but has a limitation, which is that it only works with primitives. So object creation already is a primitive, so that's good. But for example, for these other operations, then I think at this point, none of these are implemented as primitives in Faro. And I mean, if the speed up is good enough, you can do it. But I mean, you're also adding a lot of primitives, which maybe makes sense for things like this that are like pretty core to the language, right? You were speaking of collections and strings. But then we started to think of other use cases. For example, we wanted to have potentially arithmetic operations between arrays or matrices. We wanted to have maybe image processing or graphics, like say, I want to take an image and want to make everything a bit more lighter. And that's a perfectly valid option for this. And it's not really core. So having primitives in the VM for that is kind of like awkward. The same thing for like things like CSV or JSON parsing or UTF-8 validation. There are things that are definitely not part of the core of your language. But I mean, from, from all of this, I mean, this sounded kind of strange, but we wanted really to push this and see uh, how it felt to implement something like this using primitives. And we actually had the need to do so because one of uh, our teams of colleagues in INRIA was, were working with uh, Faro AI, which is a library for doing linear algebra and machine learning. Um, they were having kind of like exactly this problem. So they were floating most of the work to a library that already exists that's called APAC. It's like an ancient uh, Fortran library that is specialized in linear algebra and it's super fast. But then you have to like go to that world and come back. And there was like a few operations that they had to do in the Faro world, which were like aggregations and very, very simple operations between arrays. But since they have arrays with millions of elements, then it was taking them minutes to things that in other languages may take like a few seconds. And well, so we had our test case. We started by implementing primitives. So like in this case, we had to, we wanted to create three of them. One for adding arrays, uh, subtracting arrays and multiplying them. Uh, one interesting thing is that one of the restrictions of CIMD is that you need to know the size of your elements. As I mentioned at the beginning, the, um, in order to know how much parallelism you can have, you need to know the size of each element. So you cannot use like any array because you don't know the size of each element. What you have to do is use a specific type that already uh, encodes every element as a float, uh, a 64-bit float. And thus, so we have like a, a concrete class, which is a float64 array. And we define these primitives that were for the, each of the arithmetic methods we wanted to implement. And I actually, well, we have that, and I'm going to show a small demo. So here, the first implementation is just the scalar one. So it's pretty much the example I show first when I was introducing the subject. The second one is the primitive. I'm not going, oh, too small. Uh, can someone help me and? Standard fonts, uh, try medium or large. Standard fonts. No, large. But we will open, I think, it later. Oh, OK. Oh. Yeah, I'm not in the moment where I want to remember shortcuts. OK. Cool. So here we have the flutter race I was mentioning. Then we have the implementation that shows the scalar version. That's the one I showed at the beginning. And then I have the primitive one, which is implemented as a primitive, so I won't be showing it for now. And this is like a very non-scientific benchmark, but it will give us an idea of, OK, how much faster are these? Are they like even worth the effort? And so here I'm running the scalar version. And here we have the vectorize primitive. And well, you can see that for the scalar operation, we could do 3,000 operations in uh, the few seconds that the benchmark took. The other one was 213 times. So it was 
um, 70 times more the primitive one than the scar one. So, well, that actually looks promising. And I mean, it shows that, well, doing this type of operations really pays off. So the cool thing is that they are really fast. The not so cool thing is that, well, they are very, very low level. So to give you an idea, I'm going to show you the, a, a piece of this that we use for zeroing out the references, so putting all the nils when you create objects. And this is kind of like the method that does that. I don't want you to understand exactly what's happening, but the important thing is that the, at the level that we're working in, like if you look at this, it's like assembler, like uh, compares, jumps, uh, storing things, registers, registers everywhere. And this is not really a good place to be working all the time, especially if you're going to be creating multiple abstractions and you want to reuse things and want to like extract common behavior. For example, here, we're doing exactly the part that does the filling. So you say, okay, this is start address, this is the end address, this is the value I want to fill it with, reasonable. But then we say, okay, I want you to have this vector register and use it because, well, vector registers are limited, they are named, and so you cannot just take one and use it because maybe it's already used. So it needs to be provided. So you're working in like super mutable world all the time, which is not very good if you're going to be like doing things that want, you want to be composable. So, well, that's not so cool. Uh, so we start to think of alternatives. How can we implement this in another way? Uh, well, I mean, we already have an abstraction, uh, an intermediate level a representation for our code, which is bytecode. And actually, bytecode has kind of like the same um, way of being processed than primitives. So bytecode is also interpreted until it runs enough times and eventually it should compile. So it could be a good candidate. And something that's very, very cool is that bytecode is already an abstraction over working with registers. When you're working with a uh, bytecode, you are not thinking about, well, uh, I'm going to be using some or register or another. That's something that's hand handled behind the scenes. So um, the question was, can we implement things using bytecode? And well, we did. We created some like more granular operations. For example, we were able to load a chunk of um, an array into a vector. We were able to do operations on them so we could add, subtract, or multiply. And we could also then store that vector back into an array. And then if you want to operate on like a whole operation on an array, for example, doing uh, adding two chunks of two arrays and storing the result into a third one, then you just compose bytecodes. And here, for example, we are pushing a chunk from the first array, here from a second one, then we add them together, and then we store the result. Um, the cool thing about this is that, well, this is the, the representation for adding two chunks, but if you want to subtract, the only thing that changes is this one, and if you want to multiply, then it's only one. So in general, this is way more composable and higher level than working with assembly. It's not something that you want your users to be using. I mean, you want, I don't expect people to be writing bytecode by hand. And spoiler alert, we still don't have like a front end for this, so as a final user, you still have no way of using this. But I mean, as a VM implementer, that already makes our lives way easier because it makes implementing new things way uh, faster and it also makes it more extensible. Um, well, we actually have, I actually have the implementation here as well. And before showing the graph, I'm going to run the um, bytecode version. So as a recap, we have 3,000 operations for the scalar, 200 for a uh, 200,000 for the uh, primitive and for the vector. Oh, he's kidding me. Enter. No. Because my control P died right now. So <laughs> no, no. Well, I'm going to sorry how to show the graph directly. So the thing is that uh, 
the cool thing is that both vectorized versions are way faster than the scalar ones. So here we have two graphs that we actually did with more thorough benchmarks. Here that you can see that we are measuring the same operation, adding arrays, but we are doing that. Oh, uh, presentation. presentation. There. So two graphs, same operation, adding arrays, but we are doing that with uh, different array sizes. So very small arrays to very large arrays and uh, we're comparing the three implementations. So red is scalar, uh, blue is the primitive, and the yellow one is the bytecode. And we actually can see a couple of things here. One thing is that, well, the vectorized implementations are way faster than the scalar one. So we can get up to like 200, 200, and almost 250. Um, also that the speed up is not constant. So actually, uh, something interesting here is that there's like a sweet spot for using them. It's not that at some point they are slower than the scalar one, but eventually when you get to very, very large arrays, the speed up is not so much. And the reason for that is that the type of operation we're doing is not very CPU intensive. So we're loading stuff from memory, we're doing an addition, and we're storing the result back. And actually at some point, the CPU starts being the, stops being the bottleneck and the memory becomes the bottleneck. And well, uh, CMD instructions can do much help there. So they're not a magic bullet. They're not going, you're not going to sprinkle it in any code and it's going to be faster. But it's interesting and also uh, the hypothesis is that if you have more computations, so if you're doing something more complex than just adding stuff, uh, then you probably take more time to get to the point where memory becomes a, a, a bottleneck. But I mean, that's a hypothesis. I don't have a benchmark to back that up. But the most important thing that I wanted to highlight and the thing that I'm going to be focusing on for the rest of the talk is that there's a big difference between the primitive and the bytecode. So in this case, is the baseline is the scalar implementation. Here is how much faster the, the bytecode is than the scalar, and then how much faster the primitive than the scalar as well. So uh, the primitive can be almost like 200 faster, as I already mentioned. The vector, impl the vector implementation is like 50 times faster. I mean, still great, right? 50 times faster is very good, but why not 200 times faster? What's happening here? And we actually investigated that, and we found that the reason for that is that bytecode it has a lot of safety checks. So um, when you're using bytecode, you can compose bytecode in any arbitrary sequence, and yet you want to prevent at least the ones that the that will cause like catastrophic consequences. For example, if I'm doing, if I'm reading from an array, I'm reading directly from memory. So it's like I'm looking at the object and I'm just grabbing a piece of data from there. And you don't want to let people extract the random data from any type of object. You want to restrict it to, for example, float 64 arrays because you're meant to do that. But if you take that method and put it elsewhere, you don't want people to be reading from memory on any object. So you need to check that, well, you're working with float 64 arrays. Then you're also taking elements from there and putting them in, into like a, a vector. And so you're accessing an index and you need to check that the index is in bounds. Okay, well, you need to do that check. And for example, as I mentioned, you're working with chunks of elements. So for example, we have an array, a vector where you can put two or four elements. Okay, you still need to iterate many times to operate on the whole array. And that one requires a, a number, an iterator, to be able to go through the array. And that, well, when you iter um, in increment it, then, well, you need to check that there's no overflow. And it seems silly, but these are operations that you're doing on every bytecode that you use. And uh, they eventually add up and cause this, most of these uh, slowdowns that you were seeing before. And we actually said, so, okay, well, in this case, maybe you care about performance, you don't care about security, so, you know, YOLO, let's remove these checks and see what happens. And actually, it was quite interesting. We removed the first two, which were the easy ones to remove because it, they were the ones that we added in the first place. So, well, then let's not check that we're using Flow64 arrays. We just assume that you're using them on the type they were meant to be used, and we're not doing bound checks. Who cares about that? And well, actually, it became way faster. So here the baseline is the safe bytecode, and this is the unsafe one, the one that has no checks. And this is like 
um, how many operations were made by a second. So uh, in average, like the unsafe bicon was twice as fast and, uh, than the other one. And remember that the difference was like uh, four times the total. So kind of like by removing these two checks, we already uh, reduced the difference by half. And that's kind of cool because it already got us closer and actually to a performance that made sense for us for what we wanted to do. And, but the question was, okay, can we have it all, right? Can we have the composability that Bytecode gives us without having to have this performance penalty, and, but still making sure that things are safe? I mean, you don't want things in real life to be insecure or crashing horrible, horrible ways. And well, I mean, what would it take to have it all? And something interesting here is that actually the problem are not checks per se. The problem is that you're doing them on every bytecode. So every time you're pushing something from an array or every time you're storing something or every time you're adding, you're checking that everything is the right type. If you're accessing an array, you're checking the bounds. And that's something that when you have the whole sequence of bytecodes, you could check probably only one or twice, like once for each array, and you're done. Um, the problem is that, well, we don't have something that does that, that can take a look at the whole bytecode sequence. Um, the good thing is that if we have the, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, work done, both in academy and in industry, to removing each and every of the types of tests that I already mentioned. So there's like type test elimination, there's bound checking elimination, there's overflow test eliminations, which means that if you can see the whole thing, then you should be able to optimize them. But I mean, in the case of Faro, what will, it, what will we need to be able to achieve that? Well, we will need an optimizing compiler, which does exactly that. It takes a look at, for example, an entire method and performs optimizations. And well, sadly, it's something that we still don't have yet. We're working on that, but we don't have it. So for now, you can choose between living in a safe world or living in a fast world. And hopefully, at some point, we can have some, um, a world where you can have both. And so just as a quick recap, what will we talk about? Uh, we talk about what sim instructions are. We talk about how we already use them to speed up primitives that are in the Faro ecosystem. So creating objects now is, can be twice as fast by using these instructions. And then we kind of like uh, talk about the CMD design space. So of these two different approaches of how to implement this, we talk about primitives, which are cool because they are super fast, and they are terrible because they are like super low level. And we talk about bytecode, which is higher level, is composable, but uh, it's has uh, this trade-off between speed and uh, safety. So that's all I have to talk about today. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. <laughs> if you want me to talk more, Gishe, you can make questions. I think you answered that here, but you mentioned that the, with the creation, you speed up 2x. But 2x the creation of the objects, or 2x the, the, the speed of the VM? No, the creation of the objects. So the cool thing is that you're creating a lot of objects all the time, and especially in things that like working with arrays or working with collections in general, if you're using order collections. It also helps, for example, when you are adding elements to a collection and you need to, it, it's resize, resize. Well, a new array is actually allocated underneath uh, it all, all the abstractions, mm -hmm. and so it helps there. Okay. So it's a object creation, yeah. Object creation, okay. And the second is, uh, you mentioned that Maybe the includes and the are equals or yes. uh, um, messages could be yes. as equal yeah. elements. Yeah, could uh, you know uh, be impacted by this structure? But I don't see why because I mean the includes have references to objects. So how will this oper this uh, instruction help you? <coughs> you know, uh, check if. An object is equal to another. I don't see how. So um, yeah, you need to have some idea of like a, a reference to the object, like a position in memory, for example, yeah. and you could check by that. Oh, okay. So, for example, if you have a reference to, to a memory position, but it's not yeah. include then. It's uh, something that it will check for the identity, but not equality. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Cool. Um, yeah. Those were my questions. Any other question? Come here. <laughs> Move. No, dale pocho primero. Pocho primero. Sí, adelante. So the question is, how do you deal with the?
different sizes of the objects when you are initializing and different sets of registers if you have different architectures? Okay, so the second question is easy. For now, we're assuming 128, which is kind of like the common denominator uh, between all the like popular architectures. So we're supporting this. I didn't mention that. We're supporting this in uh, Intel's like uh, SSC 4 for the ones that know it, which is kind of like present in most of modern uh, Intel CPUs, and also the la latest ARM, the ones that has the MacBooks. And but I mean, just to be like. Just to use things that should be widely supported, we're using um, fixed size vector registers. Uh, so that takes care of one problem. The other one was how do you know the size of each element, if I understood correctly? How many instance variables you have to use? Oh, so in the case of, so how many instance variables when you are? Yeah, so how many instance variables you have to initialize, right? So if you have to initialize maybe four instance variables, you need to initialize four slots. Yes. If you have, no, I don't know. 20, you have to do a cycle. Yes. So you, you manage it in different cases, or you just? You just, well, that's a funny thing. So this is kind of specific, but we know that we're doing it uh, like twice, uh, two at the same time. Mm -hmm. So with, it's like amount of instance variable divided by two. And actually, that can be problematic, because maybe you have an odd number of instance variables. The cool thing is that when you're allocating objects, the objects are being located in a linear space. So you're always creating objects one after the other. And the space where you do that, for safety reasons, already has like a trading space for safety. <laughs> and so it's safe. You can have like one extra instance variable that you're needing, and you're not going to be to bothering anyone. anyone. <laughs> it's kind of a hack, and there's a big comment on it. <laughs> but yeah, if you're working on more like general things, you need to start thinking about that. What happens, for example, if the number of elements doesn't match the number you're like dividing by? So if you're working with four elements, what happens if your uh, array is not a multiple of four? And there are different strategies to deal with that, but yeah, hopefully, uh, luckily this time we have to do that because Great. we have luck, yeah. Oh, yes, my, my, my question was around the same. Topics, but uh, for instance, uh, are you using uh, because I, I only have experience with Intel, mm. and uh, I found that there are two versions of most of these uh, instructions which are aligned and unaligned. Yes, and aligned are known to be much faster. Yes, we also got lucky with that because objects are already aligned to 64 bits. Ah, okay. So the alignment has to be for uh, for context when you're working with this, this sort of operations. Depending on the architecture, it generally helps if uh, the elements you're working with are aligned in memory with the size of the type you're working with. So if I'm working with ints, which are 32 bits, I want memory positions to be multiples of 32 bits. Now, uh, in our case, like objects are already 64-bit uh, aligned, and the header is also like 64 bits. So it's like everything's aligned up to uh, types that are 64-bit wide, and in general, you work up to like that size. So okay, so you can use the aligned version exactly. for free. Okay, yeah. and uh, and you already uh, said that you are using the the 128 bit uh, size yeah. because yes. you are not using the the larger ones. No, we were, we have some ideas about like being able to dynamically set the size of the uh, our the vectors we're working with, but yeah, we didn't get to implement that. For now, we're working only with that size. Okay. So have you tried different processors to see the difference in the speed up? Yes. Uh, well, actually, this one that I run it with is different from the one where I have these benchmarks. So the benchmarks were made in a Mac with an M1 processor, so ARM, mm -hmm. latest ARMs, the fastest ARMs. And now I'm running this on the Intel uh, architecture. And actually, the speed ups were different. Like, the orders of magnitude were pretty much the same. But if I had been, well, actually, I can show that. Um, here, the, um, this is like 70 times faster than the, um, than the um, Scalar version for 10,000, right? So if you see here, the, in, the Mac version was like 200 times faster. So actually, we had bigger speed ups when working with um, um, the ARM architecture. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you.